we're going to talk about transportation and Los Angeles. And I, I will confess, I wanted to do this panel because I am a transportation nerd. I mean, part of it is because I love real estate. And real estate without transportation is dirt. Right, it, it has almost, no, it has no, well, almost no use. It can be beautiful, it's nice to look at, but uh, you, you don't get a lot of cash flow if you don't have some sort of transport. Um, to, to give you a flavor of the sort of transportation nerd that I am, I can tell you the name of every interstate highway in the US and what state it goes through, which shows how pathetic <laughs> I am. Uh, and I'm thrilled to have um, oh, transportation. I'm not a mic expert either. I'm not an audio expert. I'm not a transport expert. I just play one on TV. Um, people who are going to be very adept at telling us about um, intra uh, Los Angeles movement and inter Los Angeles movement uh, is, I think this will surprise a lot of people because the stereotype of Los Angeles is everybody drives by themselves in a car. Okay. There is an awful lot of that, but we're not remotely the leader in the country in terms of the number of people who drive alone, although actually the leader is the Inland Empire, which is right next door to us. But the second largest uh, bus transit system in the US is here in Los Angeles, if you look at the number of passengers. Um, and it has a top 10 heavy rail system, which is really impressive given that there is one heavy, or actually two heavy rail lines in Los Angeles, and I think the leading light rail system in terms of passenger yes. traffic in the country. So we really do have quite a lot of transit here, and LA Metro is in charge of that, but a number of other things as well, as we're going to hear. And of course, our airport is enormous, and one of the things that people look at me um, weirdly when I say this is I consider LAX one of LA's greatest assets. And people love to hate on LAX, but here's how I think about it is I lived in Madison, Wisconsin for many years. And you know what? I could get to the airport 35 minutes before my flight and have no trouble getting on the plane. And by that I meant I could drive my car and park and walk and get through security and get on the plane. The problem is to go anywhere from Madison, you either had to go through O'Hare or Denver. And you waited on the tarmac until you got clearance, mm -hmm. and very often you'd wait an hour, an hour and a half, and then it was forever till your connection. And so door to door from my house in Madison to wherever I wanted to go could take a really long time. Whereas in LA, door to door to almost anywhere in the world is, yeah, there's an extra hour built in because of the horseshoe and it feels terrible while you're there. But at the end of the day, door to door, I can get to Frankfurt, I can get to London, I can get to Tokyo, I can get to Shanghai in a remarkably short period of time. So that's, and, and so before the pandemic, it was the number three passenger airport in the country, the number three um, uh, cargo airport in the country, the only airport that was in the top five in both of those metrics. So we have a lot to talk about when we're talking about how we do transportation in LA. And we have two great um, gentlemen here to do it. Um, Jim De La Loza is the chief planning officer for LA Metro. Um, Sean Burton, I'm sure you all know him in his role of running City View, but also was the president of the um, LA World Airports Commission and now does work with the federal government uh, on airports. And so they have deep knowledge and deep operational expertise. And what I've asked them each is to spend five to 10 minutes just talking about their various systems, and then we've talked about some conversation we're going to have, and then again we'll open up uh, to the audience for questions. So, Jim, let's start with you. Sure. Well, uh, thank you for for inviting me. Um, I've had a long history of involvement with uh, USC, although I I did go to UCLA, but welcome. I'm glad to be here again. Um, a little bit about myself. I've got 40 years of experience in transportation in Los Angeles County, uh, half of it in the public side and half of it in the private side. Um, now I head the, um, uh, the planning and project development side of LA Metro. And LA Metro is a complex organization. We are a multimodal agency, and that means that we do everything from uh, planned bikeway pedestrian systems through uh, our larger rail and highway uh, projects uh, for LA County. You know, we recently adopted our largest budget. We had a $9 billion budget this year. 
It's a very well-funded agency, funded through four half cent sales tax in Los Angeles County, which allows us to uh, really uh, be very aggressive in terms of uh, trying to build back some of the transportation that was here years ago. Uh, back in the early part of the, uh, oh, in the 1900s, um, uh, we developed a rail system that at one point was the uh, largest or I would have that checked, but I think it's larger the second largest in the country. It was a, a, a trolley-based system. Uh, during, uh, 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 after the war, with the increase in, in, in vehicle usage and uh, uh, issues with the uh, uh, collisions between the rail uh, and, the, and, the, um, and the cars and a whole bunch of other, and you probably read some of them in terms of General Motors and some, and those are speculative. I don't know the reality there, but basically we switched to a car-based system and built the best highway system in the world. And we are now suffering uh, the effects of that. I mean, we've reached the point of, uh, of maximum uh, usage of that. We're in, uh, and have been for a long time in the, yeah, uh, uh, with dealing with a lot of congestion and the impacts that come with that congestion, both economic, uh, social, and health-wise. We are um, moving towards a development of a program and a plan that aims to significantly reduce the vehicle miles traveled in the region uh, and deal with some of the uh, issues related to uh, this congestion, uh, not just for vehicular, but also the movement of goods. And I think you'll hear a lot more about that uh, uh, the next speaker. But again, LA is a major destination and, and pass-through point for cargo coming through the ports of LA and Long Beach uh, and LAX. And, uh, and uh, that uh, is something we're going to have to uh, continue to deal with, because 60% of those goods are destined for us. I mean, we become such a large metropolitan area. I think you mentioned land use, the relationship to land use, and there's always been that relationship, starting with the railroads. When they were built, that's still there. And that is that uh, transportation is about connecting where people um, uh, live to where they want to go, especially uh, where they're employed. And we're uh, dealing with that, not only with building a system, but also looking at measures to reduce the need and where we, you know, have, uh, that's been accelerated through the uh, pandemic in terms of uh, reducing the number of, of trips to work. Um, currently, we are working on some major projects. We have 22 billion um, in construction right now, including one that just opened the regional connector in downtown, which I believe the university uh, should be ha very happy about that because that does really connect it much simpler to, to this campus. The subway through um, um, uh, Wilshire Boulevard that is uh, well into construction and that will connect downtown eventually to the west side of Los Angeles and then uh, uh, a few other major projects but including the Sepulveda Pass project which is probably the largest project we've undertaken. It's it's a approximately $12 billion uh, connection from the valley uh, to the west side again through the 405 uh, Sepulveda Pass corridor. Again some major projects but again it's a combination of not only dealing with this on the supply side, but also on the demand side. Uh, we have got some, some big challenges. Uh, Metro is, uh, does this in partnership. Uh, we mentioned land use. We don't uh, control land use. We partner with the cities, and one example was um, in Hollywood. When we built the subway through Hollywood, we partnered with the redevelopment agency to put in place the land uses, the higher land uses around the station areas uh, that, would, that would allow us to control growth around it but accommodate development, and you've seen that with the Hollywood uh, developments in Hollywood and Highland and Hollywood and Vine, which were the first developments in the 70s to develop uh, in that area. But again, we, we uh, uh, work very closely with both the public and private sides on, on development of land uh, with the lands we own and have uh, built uh, approximately 10,000 uh, housing units in the, in the region, and we have a commitment to build another 10,000 that we, uh, uh, over the next uh, uh, five to ten years. Uh, so again, it's a, it's a complex organization. It's an it's a, uh, agency that, uh, that uh, does uh, have a, a huge challenge, um, but uh, I'm sure we'll get some questions and we can respond a little bit more in detail to some of those, but thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, before I start, I just want to thank uh, Richard for putting this together and the Lusk Center, um, which pr provides an incredibly important 
role here in Los Angeles for scholarship and real estate and to bring people together, so thank you. Um, and I'd be remiss not to mention Priya and the Pension Fund Real Estate uh, Association. Um, uh, Gail is here and, and Amy, and they do a wonderful job. Um, there's about $10 trillion of assets that are controlled by Priya members and investments, and Gail and Amy sp spent time to bring people together, to educate them, and to connect people. So anyway, thank you for, for putting this on. I'll just say a few words about LAX. Uh, how many people here have been to LAX? Okay. How many of you have had a wonderful experience at LAX? There we go, a few. How many of you have been challenged at some time getting in and out of LAX? Okay, so, um, so you're very familiar. I'll just give a little bit of background on the airport. I will say, as Richard said, I'm no longer president of the board, so I can speak freely. You can say anything you want. You can insult me. Um, that was a volunteer position I did for eight years on behalf of the mayor. Um, I could not go to a cocktail party in Los Angeles without somebody stopping me with a story about LAX. Uh, maybe two of them were positive in eight years. Uh, but, but in all seriousness, I, it was quite a passion of mine when uh, LAX, just uh, on the numbers, uh, is um, one of the largest infrastructure assets in the world. Um, it sits on just over 3,500 acres. Um, it is uh, pre, when I came on the board, uh, we had about 66 million passengers per year. Uh, we got up to 88 million uh, by 2019, right before COVID. And this was for an airport that was designed in the 1960s. Actually, John F. Kennedy came out to, to do the kind of opening of the jet age at LAX in 1961, um, had about 4 million passengers a year. Um, so it's incredibly busy. Um, so when we came in in 2013 under uh, Mayor Eric Garcetti, he put a new board in place. Our job was to figure out what was the biggest challenge facing LAX. Uh, and we're actually pretty good at a few things, getting airplanes to take off and land on time. If you look compared to other airports, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty good. You can fly to I don't know, something like 200 cities and 70 countries from, from LAX. So there's a lot of safety and security. We're actually pretty good too, knock on wood. That's the most important thing but it was a terrible experience to get inside uh, of LAX, to get into that horseshoe that, that Richard mentioned. Um, it just wasn't designed for that. So we spent two years working on a, a planning program. We looked at 88 different possibilities, and we ended up kind of launching a $15 billion master plan uh, to bring uh, a train into the airport and pull about half of the traffic out of the central terminal area. Um, and for the first time in history, connecting to Metro. That was a major priority of uh, mayors for, for decades. Uh, and it'll actually all be connected as of next summer. Um, I'm sure as you drive in LAX, you see what's happening there. Um, we also built the largest rental car facility in the world. Um, they actually say you can see it from space. I don't know if that's true or not, but that will be open next summer. Um, we built a new international terminal, and we modernized every single one of the other terminals at LAX, except for four, because American was bankrupt. That's on its way. But every other single airport, every other single terminal was modernized. Each one is the size of a Minneapolis or a mid-sized American airport. So um, it was a lot of fun for a real estate guy. That's why I'm in the real estate business. I'm a builder. So it was a lot of fun to be able to do that uh, on behalf of the city. Um, I've left the board now. I'm now doing the same thing in the National Airport Authority in Washington. So I'm back there once a month. Uh, but that's what, that's what LAX is focused on. And I know we have lots of topics to talk about, Richard, so maybe I'll, I'll leave it there and then we'll, we'll take your questions. The fact that it is a hub airport for American, Delta, and United, and essentially Southwest. And so the fares are incredibly competitive here. It's really cheap to fly out of LAX relative to a whole lot of other airports. And where you learn, see, economics really w does work, is there are some cities that has only one airport going on the route, and they are incredibly expensive. So that the fact that we're not a fortress hub for one airline, I think, is a very valuable yeah. uh, aspect of LAX. So let, let's talk a little bit about um, the future of both. So let's start with Metro. Is you know something that transit systems around the country are facing is. Um, Loss in ridership because of the pandemic, and you know, work from home obviously has a direct impact on how often people are riding. And there are people who are talking about the problem of a doom loop for transit in all kinds of cities around the country. So how does how does what stops that doom loop, and how do you get people riding transit again? Let alone getting back, getting be 
what we, I think, all need is more people to use transit than was the case before the pandemic so we can reduce VMT. Yeah. Next, we, we took a look at this. Every year, the Texas Tech comes out with their evaluation of cities and the most congested cities in the country. LA is always number one, and uh, we were anticipating a call from the time, so we did some research. And, uh, you know, basically, one of our, our problems, is we, we, well, not problems, we, we did build a, a fairly a good, uh, for this time, highway system. Um, we also have modeled what it would take to get to the point where the whole system operates efficiently. And right now, our, our mode split, and that's the percentage of people that take public transit, is around 4 or 5%. If we were able to, we modeled it by using some incentives uh, that are um, congestion pricing, light incentives, we're able to move that mode shift to 12%. And that was where we need to get. Again, we don't have to be at 100%. We have a system that really is, um, you know, our infrastructure is based on uh, single occupancy and buses. And most of our buses operate on the street. Um, what we need to do is come up with incentives to uh, get to that 12 percent, and they're, 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 some of them happen naturally. Uh, cost of parking in major urban centers, uh, that, that moves people towards public transit uh, very quickly, and I think that, that uh, that's going to be one of the factors. Also, looking at pricing, and that's something that we're going to have to take a look at, uh, how we use pricing to incentivize use of public transportation. But the most important thing is really to deal with the current problem we're having in terms of the safety on the system. And that's one thing that I think you've seen. I mean, it, it's not just Los Angeles. It's a, it's a countywide problem. It's a national problem. And it really you know, links to uh, some other issues that we have to deal with uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of what's going on uh, with, um, you know, uh, with both homeless and, and, and substance abuse. And that is impacting the system, and that is impacting the ridership. So that has to, the system has to be safe, reliable, and we need to get there. Um, and I think our board has taken some pretty aggressive actions that are um, really uh, deal with the issue in a compassionate way. We're not, uh, we, you know, we, we don't see these people as criminals, but we do understand that the, the system has to be safe. And our riders, uh, which in most cases are some of the lower income people in the city, are the ones suffering from this. So, you know, it's a difficult problem, but I think we're doing some, some taking some pretty good steps towards that, including partnering with uh, several social service providers and housing authorities to do that. So I, I just a, a quick follow-up comment, and then I just want to pull the audience on something. So I will say on Monday, I took, uh, I was excited to take the regional connector, mm -hmm. so I took it to work. And I counted, because this is what I do, the ratio of men to women on the train was mm -hmm. about nine to one. Yeah. And that, that summarizes your Absolutely. safety. Issue. Yeah, and we did a study on how women use public transportation. Got a lot of good feedback, and, and it is it, there is a difference, and we are seeing as you know uh, in the surveys we've done that data is coming back to us as well. So, but I want to ask the audience though, as we heard about congestion pricing, and l let me start by asking, how many of you folks live in a city that would you say has bad traffic congestion? Okay, keep your hands up. How many of you be, would be willing to pay $10 a day to avoid congestion? Okay, that's pretty good. Usually I get people starting to throw things at me when I suggest these sorts of things. But this is one of these things that con we were talking before about the political economy of doing things. Economists love congestion pricing. The public, when you present it to them, <laughs> does not. But that said, like in Stockholm, famously, the, the government did it, even though the polling said people would hate it. And then after it was done, um, people discovered they really liked it because having that certainty of, you know, whatever, 50 kilometers an hour, people saw, yeah, this is, this is worth it. So how do you see us making this transition to making congestion pricing be something people are okay with so we can actually move forward with it? I, I think incrementally. I think that one of the things that technology offers us is the ability to do that in a targeted way. So we can pick certain geographies where the problem is worse and begin to implement the programs in those downtown Los Angeles, for example. Uh, or it can be done around events. Uh, it, you know, we have looked in the past at uh, the area around Staples Center during events. So we can target it that way and build on that. But it is, it is probably the, most, uh, the biggest challenge that we have. So, Sean, could you talk a little bit about um, where you see the future of air service? And, and, and I mean, 
Specifically LAX, so we talked the other day, you said it has a capacity of about 120 million passengers right. a year. So you're about three quarters. Right. In 2019, you were about right. three quarters there. But there's also the broader system. And you know we've talked about, there's a lot of stuff in the news about weather delays or non-weather delays and um, flights being canceled. And uh, where, do you, where do you see the quality of service going? Are we saturated already, or is there an opportunity for more capacity in the system? I mean, I, you know, anybody who's traveled in the last year knows that it's travels become, air travel has become a more frustrating experience, right? There's huge pilot shortages. Uh, the FAA has huge shortages. Uh, in terms of air traffic controllers. That's one of the reasons that if you fly in and out of New York, for example, they'll often just shut the airspace for three or four hours because they can't handle the planes coming in. Um, and so that's a, you know, a people issue, just like there's you know, nine and a half million open jobs in the country. Um, so I think we'll work through that um, eventually. Um, and look, the technology is getting better for, for airplanes. Um, planes are more efficient. Um, so it should be a better experience. What you are seeing is, you know, tens of billions of dollars being invested in infrastructure of airports finally, right? For many years, from really the Tom Bradley terminal being finished in 1984 for the Olympics to um, 2012 or 2013 when the first new Bradley International Terminal opened at LAX, there hadn't been any significant investment in the airport. Since then, we've spent $15 billion um, to try to improve the experience, and then there'll be another $15 billion spent in the next eight years. Um, and you're seeing it at JFK and LaGuardia and kind of other major airports. We're going to do it at Dulles in Washington now. Um, so I do think it will get better, but we have to solve this fundamental people shortage uh, that we face in other parts of the economy. So I, I put up a depressing graph uh, this morning, which showed the <laughs> well, number of, of us. 25 <laughs> to 30, no, 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 oh, look at those handsome guys, uh, 25 to 34-year-olds. The, the number of 25 to 34-year-olds is going to fall pretty yeah. precipitously over the next 15 years. So that, that would be your pool of new pilots and tr controllers and so yeah. on. So this is, a, this is just a very broad problem for the economy sure. as a whole. Right. Um, what do you think about the, the future of the airline business? So there's the famous Richard Branson quote is, you know, he was asked, how do you become a millionaire? And he says, easy, start as a billionaire and then start, start an start airline. airline. Yeah. I mean, yeah. How, um, yeah. um, how, do you, how do you see the business going forward? Because it's a very, it's a high fixed cost. Uh, you know, we, we were talking about duration mismatch before, right? And you think about what is an airline is you have long term, um, uh, liabilities, and your assets are, you know, your revenue can move around daily. And so how do you manage that? It's, it's a real, it's a fundamental problem. Yeah. Are we coming closer to figuring out how to actually make the business work, do you Look, think? Look, it's, it's, a, it's a real challenge, and obviously COVID was, you know, uh, kind of almost an existential threat to the airline industry. You know, when COVID hit, um, I went down to to meet with the team at the airport. And I said, what's the worst drop in traffic we've ever had in the history of LAX? When was it? So they went and looked, and they came back, and they said, it was in September of 2001 after September 11th. Traffic dropped 47%, right? And I said, well, how much is our traffic drop now today? And they said 95%, right? That's how bad it was. So do you know how long it took from, to get from the drop on September 11th to when it recovered to that, that same level? Does anybody have, I guess, how many years it took or how many months? Any guesses? Six months. Six months. What else? Okay. 14 years. It took 14 years for traffic to come back. Um, now traffic has dropped again, and it's just come back last month to where it was in 2013 uh, from the recession and everything else. He's got a question up there. Um, including that 14, how much did the GFC delay that recovery? A lot, yeah, because it was on its way back, and the GFC hit, and it dropped again, and then it bounced back. So you definitely had the GFC and the in the middle of it. But it's you know, old habits die hard. But what, what surprised the airlines is they've been working off kind of these 20 year models of what happened before. They laid off a lot of um, employees during the pandemic. Um, they took a bunch of money from the federal government and then they created early retirement programs, which they weren't supposed to do, and got rid of a lot of their senior people. And, and travel snapped back a lot, you know, much. You know, much faster than anybody had anticipated, which is why you have these huge shortages. So the reason I think ultimately the future of the airline business is going to be good is because people want to travel, right? I mean, you look at this. They say, you know, they say this Friday is going to be the busiest travel day in four years. 
um, or ahead of a potential long weekend. So I think it's ultimately good, but it's, you know, we got to solve these people issues. So let me ask, so um, Jim, one of the things we, we talked about is one of the most important functions of Metro is to think about goods transportation, not mm -hmm. just um, me moving people around. And of course, the airport is a huge hub for good movements. We have the largest ports in the US, although their traffic is down considerably from where it was a year ago, 18 months ago. Tell us more about what is your role as a regional agency in moving goods around, and what are the challenges that you see in that segment? We have a lot of folks here mm -hmm. who invested in industrial property, so they're gonna care a lot about that. Yeah, I would say it's probably one of the most challenging um, the biggest challenges we have uh, is fairly complex. I think we're, we see ourselves, first of all, as a, um, a, you know, a lead in some of the, the strategies, but then support on others. You know, we don't, uh, our part, we partner with Caltrans on the highway system. We work very closely with the railroads uh, in terms of the, the movement of goods on railroads. Uh, and on the arterials, we partner with the cities. Um, it's a very complex problem and one of the biggest uh, st uh, efforts we have underway now is on the 710 corridor, and that's the corridor from the ports up towards downtown Los Angeles. Now, this area, there's been a stalemate for about 20 years. Um, the communities around it have suffered. Uh, they have the highest rate of asthma and cancer. Um, it, uh, um, and a lot of that is you know, over the years, and for some reasons, some related, some not related to the movement of goods. But it exists, um, and they've uh, organized a pretty strong coalition of, of uh, health and uh, uh, environmental groups uh, to support. Now, the, the challenge has been to how do we go through a process of identifying a strategy that can meet all the needs. Now, we've already uh, rejuggled our priorities to make this equal health issue, equal air quality, and equal economic development. In, in other words, nothing's gonna happen until we get consensus from the larger groups uh, in the community, from the, uh, uh, from the leaders, electeds in the community, and to come up with a strategy, again, that it can deal with the emissions issue. And here, it's more complicated than just the, the diesel. There's also issues related to wheel wear and how that uh, uh, basically gets exposed. So again, we've uh, been successful in getting the, all the stakeholders, including both the working with the ports, working with the groups, including the truck drivers and the environmental groups, to a series of uh, uh, getting get them on, get aligned to a goals and, and objectives and measures. And now we're gonna go through the process of looking at strategies and identifying which projects are, are uh, are, um, meet those and can, we can get, again, we're not gonna always get the consent of so the full majority, but again, get, a, get enough consensus so we feel we're taking forward good po uh, policy. But it's become very complex, it's very complicated. The points of origin and destinations are very mixed, so you're not, it's not one corridor, it's multiple directions, multiple technologies, and it really takes, Metro really sees itself as the coordinator uh, and, and working together with all these partners, including the railroads, to see if we could uh, address this, again, in a more um, systematic way than just one technology. This is gonna take a, a multiple uh, approach, uh, 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 use of technology and use of strategies that, uh, that we would need consensus on. Do you see self-driving vehicles as maybe being helpful I, yes, here? Yes, absolutely. I think that, that uh, we're working and we've already partnered um, and moving forward with on electric trucks. I think we're involved in the effort uh, to do that. Our board uh, is, is pursuing, has uh, uh, awarded a $50 million uh, for us to seek federal uh, dollars on this, to match federal dollars. Um, we're coordinating to see what role Metro should play here, and right now it looks like it's on the fueling side or the charging side. I should say that you know we, but it, it has to be a coordinated effort with the trucking and all the other groups, including some of the nonprofits that are working on this issue. Uh, but yes, technology, automation, uh, you know, electric trucks, the whole bit, that allows you to more efficiently move things. And we're going to have to really, I think I think it's early, take a systematic approach to this and not going in with uh, already, uh, uh, you know, technologies of yesterday. Uh, these are, we have to be innovative and leave the room for that innovation to take place. I'll, I'll, I'll add to this on technology, so yesterday, so 
cargo is incredibly important as well um, to LAX. About, um, I was just looking up this number, $150 billion worth of goods came in and out of LAX and cargo last year. So it's the ninth busiest, not airport in the country in terms of goods, any kind of border crossing, seaport, it's very, very busy. And in, in 2016 or 17, we did a trade mission to Asia with the city and we went to Hong Kong specifically to see they have like state-of-the-art cargo facilities. And so we went there and we're there with the mayor and we're inside this huge warehouse and you have all these big pallets being automatically loaded and back and forth, double-decker. Um, it was incredibly impressive. And I remember turning to the, the head of the airport and saying, this is incredible. Is this, is this new technology? Is it available in the US? And they said, oh, we put this in 20 years ago in 1995 because um, we were so behind in the US um, in, terms of auto, in, in terms of automation. So what, what LAX actually just did a, a couple months ago is they awarded a RFP to build the first kind of double-decker cargo facility that'll be automated. Um, and we'll finally, 20 years later, 25 years later, catch up to, to what the rest of the world is doing. So I want to ask a couple of questions about sort of how rail interacts with both of you. Both, I'm going to start with intracity and then move to intercity. But Okay, the People Mover is opening um, next May, year. May next year. And May the, the Crenshaw line connection to it will also open next year. Is, is that correct? Right? About the same time. So what is your forecast about what this does, about patterns of how people get to the airport? Will it relieve congestion in the horseshoe? Are people going to use this because it's going to be so much better than, I mean, even using an Uber out of LAX is not sure. pleasant. So what do you got, both of you guys, what do you see this? this doing. I'm t I really do love it. I really do I appreciate LAX, know. but it is what it is. I've heard worse. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, so I do think it's going to be a big change. And I've, obviously, we put a lot of time and effort into thinking about this. The last thing we wanted to do is build this multi-billion dollar train that no one was going to use, kind of a train to nowhere, right? So, but, so it's, it's ultimately when it's fully functional, again, the current board and staff will make the final policy on this. So just to be clear, if there's any press in the room, I'm not speaking on behalf of the airport. Uh, but the plan will be um, to still allow private cars to go in and out, right? And still, t in your TNCs, your Ubers, your Lyfts, et cetera, will still be able to drop you off at the gate. So you're, if you're running late for your flight, you can make it. Um, but if you're going to get picked up um, by Uber or Lyft, that'll be at an area called the hub that's already been built just outside. That you'll be able to take the train to. It'll be about a two to three minute train ride. Um, but what we're, we're, we'll really make a difference is I mean, how many of you have been stuck behind those huge rental car shuttles, right? And they're empty, and they're sideways, and they're blocking half the lanes, right? So there will be zero rental car shuttles, zero hotel shuttles, zero off-airport parking. All of that traffic will be pulled out. So models show like 40 to 50% of the traffic congestion will be gone. Um, so that's very impactful. Um, now, you know, how many people will take the metro and get off and change uh, at the, the station and ride in. We don't know yet. Part of it's going to depend on Metro's ridership numbers and other things. Where it will really be used, in my, in my perspective, is there's about 50,000 people a day who work at LAX in some capacity. They work at concessionaires. They work at airlines. They work for the airports. They're doing construction. Those people all have to pay for parking, and it's expensive. Um, what we've done is we've created parking for those people near the rental car facility. So they can park there, hop on the train for eight minutes, and be at their job. So I think you're going to see a dramatic difference um, once it's open. And you have any, what's the, the K-line? Yeah. What, what are you forecasting for? Well, I think we see, um, yeah, we see increase. I think that we, one of the things to keep in mind that this is not opening by itself. We're at the same time opening multiple lines that will, um, that will help the regional connector, the downtown connector, uh, project eliminates two transfers on the system, and we've kind of seen transfers as a on, on the on a main part of the system as a main um, reason why people don't use public transportation. Uh, we're also extending the line down to uh, Torrance, and we see Torrance has built a major transportation center there. Again, I think that uh, that uh, our our numbers show an increase. I can't tell you how much, but I think what uh, one of the uh, 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 but we do see a, that improving. And again, this is one of those things that can be uh, working with the airports. We can try to maximize that as much as we can. So I want to ask a question about inner city rail, and then I'm going to open it up right. to the audience for questions. So we have, at some point, there's going to be high-speed rail from Southern California to the Bay Area, maybe. <laughs> 
But, but something that seems to be more in the cards uh, as happening sooner is the Bright Line train from uh, Cucamonga to Las Vegas. I, I mean, what are the thoughts about the interaction between, so first of all, is that competition for the airport? I mean, we saw Acela had a big impact on the use of flights between DC, New York, and Boston. And uh, again, how does Metro tie into this new intercity rail system that I, I actually do believe the bright line to Vegas will happen in my lifetime. So, yeah, and these thoughts are, from both of you. Yeah, please. These are different. You know, they, we don't see this as you know uh, competing with our, our system. They're different trips, uh, type of trips. But we we are partnering uh, involved in the bright line project. We 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 do see it as uh, connecting two major uh, uh, areas and, and uh, connect with the connections through MetroLink, and uh, connecting into our system. Um, what, um, yeah, and I do think they are going to happen. Um, I think that one of the, the, the North County has been an, a challenge in terms of, uh, of access. This will, this will hopefully help, but, uh, again, it, it's, it, you know, hopefully eventually get into Union Station, but we do see this as a, as, as, as a different market for us that we're encouraging. Yeah, I think the, the, to Vegas, I think it'll make sense. Now, whether or not the high-speed rail ultimately is built to Northern California, we'll mm -hmm. see. And whether it will cost less to take it than it costs to jump on a Southwest flight, we'll see. Um, but I think the airport doesn't view it as competition. I mean, I think the airport knows that things are congested and, and anything that alleviates that. Um, and look, the experience taking a train, I took the Acela last week. I went from Washington to New York. You show up five minutes before, there's no TSA. You can use your phone. You don't get delayed because of weather. Um, so, uh, so I think that'll be great. But the the train up north, maybe I'm more skeptical about. I think it's interesting that you said, you know, taking the train, you have to think about weather because um, it, climate is starting to have some effect on a lot of transportation. Just wondering how you think about that, maybe both of you. Climate in terms of global warming and... Yeah, yeah we, well, we see that as a, you know, we're, we're very committed to do all we can to reduce that again. Um, that's one of our major measures. We take it seriously. I think it, you know, we're both on the technology side and the reducing demand side. Uh, working uh, Metro is switching to a full electric fleet, and that's the, as you mentioned, the second largest uh, bus system in the country. Uh, uh, will be 100% uh, 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 electric, uh, and I believe over the next, you know, 10 years. I think our board set a pretty aggressive. A goal, but I think it will, be, will happen over the next ten years. But yes, no, in everything we do, it's integrated in terms of our measures. Yeah, and I wasn't implying it wouldn't imply it wouldn't affect trains as well. It's just it's gotten so bad with I mean, that's it's gotten so bad with airports. And what's interesting is I mean everybody here has experienced turbulence, and turbulence has gotten worse in the last two years, and it's expected to get significantly worse because. They're pretty sophisticated. They have pretty sophisticated tracking systems for turbulence and turbulence maps that the FAA uses and that the airlines use. And pilots actually have iPads sitting with them in the cockpit looking at turbulence. The problem is with climate change. The climate, the the microclimate is changing so dramatically that you're having more incidences of major turbulence. I mean, everybody's read about the flight to Hawaii where they hit the turbulence pocket and people had to go to the hospital, and it just happened again in Texas. And that's because these microclimates, things are changing more quickly, and they can't track them as well. So it's, fortunately, it's going to get worse, not better, with air travel. So we should wear our seatbelt all right. the time? Please, please wear your seatbelt if you're seated, yes. <laughs> what about, I mean, I, I remember there was a story in the New York Times a couple of years ago about in Phoenix it being so hot that planes couldn't take off. Is that happening more and more frequently, or was that just a, a New York Times story? because it was no, a fun New York I was in story. Phoenix when that happened. Yeah, when it gets over 118 degrees, you know, the wheels start to melt. Um, and you can't, you, can't, you can't take off and land. So yeah, it's happening. Look at the heat wave that you're having right now around the country, right? And um, you know, north of 112 degrees in Texas and other places. So yeah, I think you're going to see continued impact uh, on that front. Yes, sir. I have a question for Sean um, around the decision-making process for LA exit and some challenges that might have been unique to LAX in particular relative to other airports and how that was selected as the ultimate solution. Yeah, so, um, so, just to, so the questions around LA exit, that's the, the, uh, the Uber and Lyft lot, if you take UberX or Lyft that you pick up from. And 
So uh, that was probably one of the most controversial things we did. Um, it's the only time I was actually in New York when it opened and the mayor called me up and started yelling at me because there were 300 people, the KTLA was there and there were 300 people standing out there and no cars. Um, so basically what happened is, you know, you know, we tracked the traffic very closely at LAX and it was getting to the point around peak holidays like Thanksgiving or Memorial Day or times in summer where it was taking an hour to an hour and a half to get into the airport and get around the circle. So people calling their Uber and Lyft at you know, Terminal 4 would have to wait for that amount of time. And so you know, Uber and Lyft was a new phenomenon. In 2015, Uber and Lyft wasn't allowed to come in the airport. They were coming in illegally. We granted them um, their license. Uh, and within two years, we had 30,000 trips a day from Uber and Lyft. Um, and it was, unfortunately, it was, wasn't just replacing individual car traffic. It was replacing buses and flyaways and other mass transit that people were taking. So it became untenable. Um, we looked at a lot of different sites and ultimately determined that if you could take over that parking lot that was right next to Terminal 1 and, and use that for, uh, for Uber and Lyft, it would be much faster than create an express lane. Um, and we track all the data, and it's significantly faster. Like, it's not even close in terms of what people were facing before. Um, but I remember when it launched, there was a huge uproar, and people were very angry with us. And we brought in a crisis management firm, and they were trying to tell us. And I kept, I said, but look at the data. You know, the, the data shows. It, it's faster, it's faster. And finally, the guy stopped me and he said, look, if people are having a shitty experience, you can't tell them they're having a good one. Like, you've got to approach, which was a really valuable lesson to me, right? That, that, so, um, so that's how the decision was made. Um, uh, the nice part about it is when the train opens next summer, that will all go away, um, and you won't have that anymore. It'll be much more efficient, and we're actually going to build a new terminal for Southwest where the LA exit lot is. So, so only one more year of pain. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of my, um, one of my intellectual heroes is Robert Schiller, who um, wrote about irrational expectations and showed that the stock market didn't always work and, and so on. And one of the things, he has a new book out which basically said, telling people to look at data is never going to work if you're trying to get people to understand Follow things. Follow the science. And it's, well, it, it, it's things like crime is you can tell people for example, that being on a metro chain is actually one of the safest places you can be in the world, and it is. I mean, your probability of something bad happening to you are much lower there than being in your car because the chance of you dying in your car is way greater than the chance of you dying on a metro train. But telling people, if they look around and they think this is unpleasant, they're, they're just, they don't care. And, and so I, I love that. You can't tell people who are having a shitty experience that they're having a good one. I'm going to remember. <laughs> I'm going to remember that one. I was just wondering, what do you think it would take to really increase ridership amongst higher income groups in Los Angeles? Like in New York, for example, 56% of the population takes public transit. There's nothing close to that, as you've mm -hmm. um, indicated, and not even planned. So um, would it take some kind of, like, would you need to pay people to actually ride the subway? Yeah. or? Um, I, I in addition to public safety, which is one of the reasons that... Yeah, I, I think know. it's the basics. And, and I know this because years ago, we put in place a service on Wilshire Boulevard called Rapid Bus. And, that, um, and what Rapid Bus did, it, it, it added technology to the buses to trigger green lights as it's coming. We had fewer stops. We had stations where you had a next bus display. And it, it, uh, it did really well. We had... Uh, we did a, a study afterwards, a post-implementation study, that found that uh, we had a 30 percent uh, increase in ridership uh, and a 40 percent increase in discretionary riders. And these were people that, that had autos, had the income to use other transportation, but chose to take public transportation because, again, it was safe, reliable, um, on time, and got them to their point. I mean, I think the same factors will do that, but I think uh, Right now, I think what we're seeing is probably the biggest loss is in discretionary riders on the system. So it really is, uh, again, you know, focus on providing a service that does that um, and is affordable. I think if, you know, uh, and right now our, our system is probably one of the most affordable ones in the country. And we are, in fact, even looking at uh, options for a free, uh, free fare. So let me follow up on that with one thing. So we haven't talked about bus rapid transit. And mm -hmm. for those of you who don't know, there's a BRT, a dedicated BRT lineup in the San Fernando Valley called the Orange Line. Mm -hmm. And the ridership on that has, since it opened, been spectacular. There's the Silver Line. I mean, trains are fun to talk about, but are there any plans for more BRTs? Yeah. 
So I remember the, the Wilshire thing, I remember I would try to drive behind one of those buses. Because yeah. oh, yeah. if you were in your car, you would go down yeah. Wilshire Boulevard faster if you could and get that, behind and, and, one of those buses. And, and that was one of the other added benefits <laughs> that we saw. It, it, acted, it acted like a signal synchronization for other traffic as yeah. well, so that's good to hear. Yeah. Um, yes, there is plans. I think that we, you know, I was uh, on the, the, the trip a long time ago. They went to Curitiba, Brazil. They looked at the system they had. And they, they had were one of the first uh, cities in the world to develop bus rapid transit. And uh, so we emulated that. We came back with on Wilshire Boulevard in the San Fernando Valley in Ventura. And uh, right now, we're looking at expanding eight, eight additional lines, including one on Vermont here, one on Broadway, and those to open uh, before the uh, 28 Olympics. So again, I think that we're starting the study, uh, uh, the environmental on that uh, within the next uh, two, three months. You know, I, I, I did some work in Sao Paulo for a while, mm -hmm. and they have among the worst traffic in the world. Yeah. They make our traffic look like nothing, but they have BRT, and I'd use it. Mm -hmm. And I'd feel guilty because it was like a dime to use it. And I was thinking I shouldn't be taking up the space of these people who really need it. But I'm not that good a person, so I did it anyway. <laughs> but it worked in, I mean, the, the congestion you can't even imagine, even by LA standards. But the BRTs worked great. Uh, Gloria has a question. Have you thought of having a tram like going around the airport, LAX, like Denver has in Atlanta? It's just so fast. So, so when the people mover is done next May, there will be a there'll be a train that will go up through all the gates. Um, we couldn't do it, and we looked at 88 different configurations. We couldn't do it in a circle because there wasn't enough room, but basically there's two lines and it goes up a spine, and there'll be three stops, um, so you won't have to. And by the way, if you, if you start at the very end at the rental car facility, which is where the metro connection mm -hmm. will be, right, at, right off the Century Boulevard at the 405, to get to Bradley, which is the last stop, it's only eight total minutes to get that direction, right? So, and if you go to some of the closer parking lots, you know, we set up this dynamic pricing model where we've built 10,000 garage spaces here and 10,000 here in different spots. And when you get off your car, you can look on your phone and we'll use dynamic pricing to say, okay, if you wanna park here, it's $5, or here, it's $15. If you wanna park across from your gate, it may be $50. And you can make that choice, but you can take that train back and forth inside the terminal. And so. how long a walk will it be from the, uh train station to security, roughly? It's, uh, it's, it's the train stations, if you, if you can see them now, um, they're right in the center of the central yeah. terminal area, so they're not very far. Um, I forget the amount of feet they are, but they'll be moving walkways as well, oh, so you okay. won't have to. Yeah. So it, admittedly, it's, it's a self-serving question, but I think maybe relevant to a fair amount of people in this room tomorrow. So Sean, if you were a general person going to LAX, how much time do you account for before you head over there? <laughs> yeah, so, I, so I, I leave my house, I live near the other university, UCLA, and it takes, I leave 30 minutes, I get there right at an hour ahead of my, uh, okay, because if you think about it, just to Do you have pre-check? I have, have pre-check, yeah. everybody should get TSA pre-check and global entry. And the other thing is, if you think about it, once you actually get to the curb at LAX, it's pretty fast. Right? The TSA no. lines are the shortest in the country of any big airport, pre-check makes them faster. The headache's getting into the airport. Now, if I was going on you know, the Sunday after Thanksgiving, I'd leave two and a half hours. Yeah, there's certain peak times. I have to, so I, I, when I worked the Obama administration, I was commuting back and forth, and so I was going from Dulles to here. And this is a pleasure compared to Dulles. Because yeah. Dulles, it takes for, you know, it's what, 20, 25 minutes from yeah. the time you get to the airport to get to your gate. Yeah. It's, um, it's no fun. So, We're fixing Dulles. Now we have a, too. Oh, okay. Well, That's anyway, nice. overall, the horseshoe is awful, but overall, we have a great airport here. Yeah. I, I am you. very grateful Thank for you. it. Um, let's give a round of applause to uh, Jim and Sean. Yeah.